Welcome back, everyone. So let me move on to discussing uh, the article I assigned you on the philosophy of love in Islam by William, William Chittick, who is one of the great uh, scholars of uh, Sufism in uh, the American Academy. Uh, he begins in discuss discussing ideas of love uh, by instancing uh, Avicenna or Ibn Sina, uh, the great philosopher of the medieval period, who was not uh, a Sufi, uh, was a philosopher, uh, but uh, he shared some ideas uh, with the uh, Sufi and Neoplatonic traditions in Islam. So uh, he says that uh, if the absolute good, which he, by which he means God, is very common in philosophy and uh, in Sufism uh, for thinkers to speak about God in a somewhat abstract or impersonal way. So one of the names of God is, is the ultimate truth, al-haq, and Sufis chant that name. Uh, and uh, uh, so for some of them, uh, the, the divine principle is a little impersonal. Uh, for others, of course, uh, they believe in the providence of God, that, that God is a creator who attends to every uh, moment of uh, his creatures. Uh, but so Avicenna is talking about the absolute good as, as God. Uh, he says that if the absolute good did not disclose itself, nothing would be received from it. Uh, it, it couldn't take care of or mother any of its creatures because it hadn't disclosed itself. Its self-disclosure is therefore the cause of every existing thing. And since by its very existence, it loves the existence of everything caused by it, uh, it loves the re reception of its self-disclosure. So uh, the language here is uh, so Neoplatonic uh, that uh, you could even hear Plotinus uh, in it. Uh, Sufis often quoted a saying with a similar sentiment, uh, I was a hidden treasure, I loved to be recognized, so I created the creatures that I might be recognized. Uh, Sufis uh, stressed also the practical teachings of the Quran, uh, which say, says that mortals should respond to God's love by loving him in return. Uh, and they also uh, often express these ideas about loving God uh, and, and God's love for uh, human beings uh, in popular poetry. Uh, so this notion of, uh, of God as um, a, um, a treasure to be found, uh, something that may seem hidden initially but which can be disclosed all of these tropes are uh, frequently referred to in Sufi writings and poetry. Uh, Sufis had a big emphasis on uh, practical feelings uh, as opposed to the abstract feelings that philosophers often discuss. Uh, and so uh, they have discussions about, you know, how can you explain what love is? And, uh, they typically decide that you can't, uh, that, that love is, is an experience. And uh, if you have experienced love, then you know what it is. But if you haven't, nobody could hope to explain it to you. Uh, Sufis wrote a lot about uh, joy and sorrow, the joy and sorrow of being in love. Uh, and um, they, uh, they explored the subject so intensively that they came up with some 80 words which at least have the connotation of love. And uh, one scholar found that the Quran uses 30 different words to indicate love. Uh, passionate love, uh, the, the word for passionate love, 
in most Muslim languages uh, or languages of Muslim majority societies uh, is ishq, which is not a Quranic uh, term, uh, but it's the word that was taken up for passionate romantic love. And so it's a word that you hear in, in, in the Bollywood films uh, all the time, which are influenced uh, by Persian and Urdu uh, diction. Um, and it was taken up by Sufis then to speak of passionate love for God. Uh, so this is this is a, a burning kind of love. It's not uh, it's not the you know uh, calm platonic uh, sort of love for God, uh, the Neoplatonist Platonist tradition. Words like ishq are used in in secular poetry and love poetry, and so and often you can't tell from reading a poem which is being invoked. That is to say, is this a poem about uh, a lover and that person's beloved, or is this a poem about a human being and the God that he or she worships? Um, so the great early Sufi uh, uh, woman, uh, Rabi al Adawiya, is said to have said, the lover of God will cry and weep until he finds rest in the beloved's embrace. So it's that restless kind of passionate love uh, that the Sufis are talking about. And they would cite the Quran, uh, which says things like, he loves them and they love him. In the Sufi philosophical tradition, uh, a, a distinction is made between uh, real love and allegorical, metaphorical love. And, and the Sufis reverse what you might expect uh, from these phrases. And so they held that human romantic love is, is the metaphorical kind. It's, it's an allegory. Uh, and the soul's love of God is the real love. And uh, this is such a powerful notion that uh, it has uh, gone into uh, the work of thinkers and poets uh, and even uh, popular culture. So when I was living in Pakistan uh, and uh, working on Urdu, uh, everybody told me this, that when we got to a word like ishq, uh, they, would, they would say, that, well, that's, uh, you know, if, if you're talking about Romantic love, that's uh, ishqi majazi, that's, uh, that's, that's allegorical. So it, it's, uh, it's a very widespread notion. Uh, and uh, so the Sufis hold that the love for the divine is the only ultimate true love. Uh, Rumi said people should not be satisfied with sunlight on the wall, but should turn back to the sun itself. So again, this is a very platonic way of speaking. You want the ideal thing and not the, the, the dim reflection in the cave of the ideal thing uh, in this material world. Uh, Ibn Arabi uh, said there is nothing in the realm of existing beings that is not a lover. And uh, Ibn Arabi was the great uh, Andalusian poet from what is now southern Spain, uh, who uh, worked love extensively into his writings about God and uh, he has a, a poem, uh, the translation of desires, which when you begin it, it just sounds like secular Arabic love poetry, uh, but he is purposing it uh, for worshipful pur purposes. Um, not only do Sufis think that people should uh, love God and uh, uh, love God passionately, but also uh, they believe that people should strive to be like their beloved uh, and try to become characterized, as they say, by the character traits of God. Uh, some even went so far as to speak of ta'alu, or divinization, which of course, as we saw uh, earlier, is uh, a Neoplatonic ideal. Um, but because in Islam, there's a very strong divide between the divine, the divine and uh, the profane. 
Um, what they typically mean by dividendization, even those who use the term, uh, is a, is to manifest as a human being the attributes of God. Uh, and so if God is loving, you try to be loving like God. If, if God is uh, full of uh, compassion, then you be compassionate and so on and so forth. And the person who best exemplifies those divine ideals, as I said, is then thought of as the, the perfect person. Um, Sufis, some Sufis at least, had a highly uh, scholastic uh, elaboration of the spiritual path. I mean, they, they thought that there were way stations uh, that you traversed uh, to get uh, to these higher states of consciousness. And um, they described acquiring a character trait of God, uh, imitating some beautiful attribute of God as, uh, as a way station or maqam on the path to God. Uh, and again, this is an, since, since they thought of the Prophet Muhammad as the perfect person, uh, this is an attempt to emulate him as well and to transform the soul uh, from its lower, uh, lower level attributes, uh, because we saw in, in the Quran and, and the way the Sufis interpreted the Quran, uh, the lower soul is uh, uh, under the command of evil. Uh, and uh, it's only if it, if it's improved, if it's worked on by spiritual exercises, that it can transcend uh, that early kind of carnal uh, desire uh, and, uh, uh, and become uh, ultimately the highest form of soul, which is the soul that's content, that is to say content with the decrees of God. Uh, the Quran itself speaks extensively of God as compassionate and, and merciful. Uh, as Professor Chittick points out, uh, you have a verse that says, call upon God or call upon the all-merciful, whichever you call upon, to him belong the most beautiful names. Uh, the beautiful names of God became a huge theme in Sufi literature, and we talked about how uh, they elaborated uh, 99 of them as special. Uh, indeed, uh, all 99 are special, but then some Sufis maintained that there was a hundredth uh, unknown, mysterious name of God, uh, which only, according to these Sufis, only the most spiritually advanced individual could hope to discover. And uh, one time when I was in uh, Tunisia back in the 90s, I went to a Sufi shrine. It was a a shrine in a mosque, and it had grown up around, uh, allegedly, uh, an early companion of the Prophet Muhammad who had migrated uh, with, uh, with other people from uh, Arabia to Tunisia and had settled there. And he was supposedly the barber of the Prophet, and he brought with him some of the locks of hair of the Prophet. So it was a relic associated with this uh, shrine. Uh, and uh, when I visited it in the 90s, the shrine seems to have been used by, or maybe in the control of, a Sufi order. Uh, and so um, I, uh, I visited with some of the young Sufis there. And one young man pulled me aside and he said, you know, our order is special. And I said, well, how is it special? He said, because of our sheikh. I said, well, how is the sheikh special? He said, he knows. I said, well, what does he know? He says, he knows the hundredth name of God, the hidden name. And I said, well, how does that manifest itself? He says, oh, he has great powers. You can just fly around the world at the drop of a hat, just with no airplane. You can just go here and there, wherever he wants to go. Uh, so uh, obviously he took this belief in a superstitious uh, direction. Uh, and uh, for, for the great Sufi masters, I think uh, that would be seen, seen as frivolous, but 
It's the kind of belief that's out there. Uh, and uh, the Quran, on the other hand, is clearly talking about something else, which is not more or less magical powers, but uh, but improvement of the soul, improvement of the character. Uh, and so God's mercy, it says, embraces everything. Uh, the Quran speaks of God's special love for those who show forth his qualities and characteristics. Uh, God, according to the Sufis, uh, is is all of those things. He's the lover, the beloved, and love itself. Uh, and they cite uh, a saying of the prophet that God is beautiful and he loves beauty. Uh, so one of the texts that I'm uh, having you read uh, is a book. It's, it's, it's poetry, but it tells stories. And it's uh, by the great Sufi Faridudin Attar, the 13th century, uh, who was from uh, Nishapur in Iran. Uh, and it's entitled The Conference of the Birds. Uh, this is a story that draws on uh, Persian fables for spiritual purposes and describes the journey of the world's birds seeking, it says, their ideal king. That is to say, seeking God, and they're looking for uh, what the poem calls the Seymour. Now, uh, the poem is using the, the term Seymour in a very idiosyncratic way. It's something uh, that Attar himself, I think, came up with because in old Persian um, religion, uh, in the myths of the Zoroastrians and probably before the Zoroastrians, uh, there was a fabulous bird called the Seymour. Uh, and uh, it, uh, according to the Zoroastrian scriptures, sat on the world tree. So there was a, a primal cosmic tree, and um, the tree bore uh, uh, seeds, and it was the flapping of the wings of the Seymour that then spread the world tree's seeds out through the earth and caused living things to grow. That's, that's the myth. Uh, so Atar, frankly, is not referring to that cosmic uh, Seymour of Zoroastrian fable. Uh, he's, ref he's using Seymour uh, to mean God and also implicitly participation in the attributes of God. So in Neo-Persian, a new Persian that developed after uh, the rise of Islam in Iran and the incorporation of many Arabic words, the old language got changed a bit. Seymour seems to mean 30 birds. It, it has a completely different etymology in old Persian, but that's what it seems to mean. And Atar used it in that sense that the Seymour is the goal of the birds but it also ultimately is the collectivity of them, the 30 that ultimately make it through in their journey. So uh, the hoopoe bird tells the other birds this journey is going to be very hazardous. So this is a quest story. Um, for those of you who know uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, um, Lord of the Rings trilogy, that was a quest. Uh, and uh, so this is this is also a quest of that sort, a medieval uh, quest story. And so the birds uh, traverse seven valleys or seven cities of love. It can be a valley, it can be a city. That's a stage, uh, is what Atar is saying, on which they have to leave behind their worldly attachments. Uh, and Atar warns them that this is a very difficult journey. Uh, many uh, obstacles will be met with. Uh, many afflictions will befall them. Uh, there, uh, there, there's a early 20th century writer who, I'm paraphrasing, uh, defined uh, an adventure as a, a series of inconveniences. If you think about adventure stories that you that you've read, that seems a very apt description. So these uh, these birds are going to undergo a series of inconveniences in this adventure 
on their way uh, to discovering the ultimate truth. Uh, so uh, these seven cities or seven valleys all have names or attributes associated with them. Uh, so love is becoming absorbed in the love of God and forgetting other desires. Uh, Atar says, next, the tempting valley of love displays itself. Whoever enters that field burns in the furnace. A true lover stakes his cash in his head for union with his beloved and his mate. So it's that passionate love that he's talking about. Then another valley is knowledge, uh, which allows, having knowledge allows a person to overcome their faults and weaknesses. Atar says no one can find a fixed road in this place because there are many roads and different destinations. And since many paths uh, the wanderer sees, each rise as his wisdom guides and foresees. And I'm drawing on, on the literature of Atar here. Um, but others have written about scholars on him. And there's uh, nothingness, uh, uh, independence. There, uh, um, well, on the way to that ultimate stage, there's independence where the person loses the desire to possess other things and becomes self-sufficient. And, you know, that's, we, we studied Buddhism and uh, uh, that seems to me uh, a value that uh, uh, is um, highlighted in the Buddhist literature as well. And there probably was some Buddhist influence on Iranian Sufism, Eastern Iran before Islam had been Buddhist. And uh, then the Mongols ruled uh, Iran uh, for uh, a century and um, uh, they brought in Buddhist monks and, uh, and established Buddhist temples while they were in power until the dynasty itself converted to Islam ultimately. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, potential. And then Iran was on the Silk Road, so you had um, Buddhist merchants coming through all the time. Uh, of course, this can be independently invented, this notion of losing one's desires to possess things, becoming self-sufficient is also uh, a value in, in other religious traditions as well. Um, uh, then there's the city of unity, uh, realizing that all creatures are from one source uh, and um, it's a realization that comes from being immersed in the divine. Uh, Tar says, if many you behold are few in the valley, they are all but one, they are one holy. Uh, so this is a, a kind of transcendent sense of unity with one's fellow human beings uh, and ultimately with God. There's the valley of, or the city of bewilderment. Uh, he says, behold, the next is the valley of bewilderment, here pain and regret ever rave and thunder when the pilgrim is in his vortex in his vortex descends he loses the path in amazement and awe uh, so again in sufism there's an elaborate consideration of states of mind uh, and uh, in this quest uh, uh, for the ultimate truth uh, bewilderment is one of those that befalls the seeker uh, and, and then ultimately nothingness or unity with the divine. And not, not as in Buddhism, the denial of the self or the becoming of the, the realization that there is no self. Uh, in Sufism, this nothingness means forgetting the self, not concentrating on it in favor of concentrating on uh, the absolute truth on, on, on the divine. So he who is ground in the absolute sea of this forever is lost, forever is in peace. Um, and let me come back now uh, to the positive psychology literature on love and compassion, uh, because that's really what these Sufis were talking about, that valley in which one sees the unity of all human beings, that uh, they, they're all individuals, they have their individual lives and attributes, and character, and so forth. But then there's also a sense in which they're all human beings. They're all, they all uh, are united in their humanness. Uh, and that therefore one should be full of compassion and kindness towards them. Uh, so in, uh, in positive psychology, 
uh, Gershide found three dimensions of love, uh, companionate love or close friendship, romantic love or being in love, and compassionate love or altruism, caregiving. And we've discussed these a bit before. Altruism is when you do something nice for someone without, uh, without wanting anything in return and without it benefiting you in any way. Uh, so Gershide sees the companionate love, companionate love as foundational, that is to say friendship, being able to have a friend, to feel feelings of friendship is foundational for the other two, for romantic love and then for altruism towards somebody who maybe isn't a friend. Uh, uh, it's been found, as we discussed earlier, that extroverts have an easier time being oriented to others. Um, introverts are, are uh, more loners and uh, uh, have to work a little bit at this, although Jung thought that over the lifetime an, an introvert can also uh, develop uh, stronger friendships. Um, and uh, those high on the neuroticism scale, people who are uh, the, about a fifth of the population are people who are uh, emotional, a little emotionally a little volatile, uh, easily offended, uh, a little bit suspicious. So they have trouble maintaining friendships and also uh, romantic relationships. And it's not that they can't do it, but they face special challenges in this regard. Um, uh, the literature argues that romantic love needs frequent repeated experience with another person, uh, attention to the singular qualities of that other person, uh, commitment, spending time together. It's been found that uh, for people who are in love, uh, joint activities uh, keep the love going, and uh, especially joint leisurely activities. So it's good if lovers have common interests that they like to cook together or go to concerts together, do, do, do things together. Uh, and then, of course, romantic love involves also that element of passion, uh, which the Sufis then took up and wanted to incorporate into their worshipful attitudes towards God. Um, Psychologists have found two kinds of passion. Harmonious passion, which is the sense of connection, has no psychological strings attached. Uh, and But then there's also obsessive passion, uh, which can decrease well-being. It's, it's not good for you, uh, which involves dependence. And there are a lot of stalker movies about an obsessive passion. Um, you would think that it's the harmonious passion uh, toward God that the Sufis would uh, emphasize and, and look for. But actually, uh, Sufi literature often makes an analogy between seeking God and obsessive romantic passion. So they, uh, they want the relationship to be one where you don't let go of God, but you're dependent on God and so forth. So they argue that... In, the case of the divine, that relationship can actually uh, be positive, even though it, it's, it's not good to have obsessive passion in a human being. Uh, and Attar, in uh, the Conference of the Birds, tells the story of Majnun and Layla. Uh, it says that one day Majnun was sifting earth in the middle of the road. A pious man said to him, Oh, Majnun, what are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for Layla. So the other guy says, well, you idiot, you can't find Layla in the, in the earth, in the, in the sand, digging in it. Uh, he said, could a pearl be found in so much rubbish? Majnun says, well, uh, I'm looking for her everywhere, but maybe I'll find her someplace. So the story of Majnun is that he was a suitor, he fell in love with this girl Layla, but her, her family didn't like him, and he was never going to get anywhere near her. And some of the Stories have him be a calendar or a wandering dervish that you know, he would be dirty and uh, unkempt and uh, the family is well off. Uh, so Majnun just can't, uh, can't find Layla. And in this story, 
uh, he's looking for her even where she isn't, which is in, in Attar's thinking an allegory for the way people should approach the, the search for God, look for God everywhere, he's saying. Um, a big part of love is altruism, caring projects, looking out for others, not only friends, but also people that one has no uh, commitments to. Uh, volunteering activities are found by positive psychologists to be particularly fulfilling and to enhance quality of life. Uh, Irani uh, found positive altruism strengthens both both hedonic and uh, eudaimonic well-being, that is to say, both uh, feeling good and also long-term uh, well-being. Um, it cultivates positive emotions and behaviors, can build strengths, uh, so uh, uh, kindness, love, teamwork, all of which then in turn contribute to well-being over time. So altruistic activities, caring activities, helping others, uh, uh, all of these are found to be highly correlated with well-being um, among psychologists. Um, people who report having more social ties, we've discovered before we talked about this, also uh, report greater well-being than those who have uh, limited such ties. You know, one circle of friends or a support group, the people you can go to to talk about your stressful, stressful events to get over them. Protect, they protect us from uh, uh, the negative effects of those obstacles that one see, uh, one encounters, uh, and social support. It's also correlated with people reporting that they feel a sense of meaning of life. Uh, and uh, so I would argue that some of these findings uh, also uh, tell us something about why there were Sufi orders. Uh, Sufi orders were circles of friends, and Sufis actually even called each other friends, uh, and they called God the friend. Uh, and um, uh, they did these joint activities together. They cultivated this friendship uh, through these ex spiritual experiences that they were having, including dance and music. Um, and uh, Sufis would also do nice things for people. And when you read uh, Attar's Memorials of the Faithful, you'll see Sufis like giving people money and uh, just, just being uh, spontaneously nice to someone that they didn't owe anything to. Uh, so all of these uh, values that are in Sufism of this sort, about having to do with, with love, with friendship, with altruism, all of these are being validated uh, in positive psychology uh, as well. Now, I should underline, I'm not saying that everything the Sufis did uh, was um, uh, necessarily good. Uh, I think the, uh, the tendency to bow down with kind of complete obedience to the Sufi master was probably pernicious. Uh, and uh, uh, there, are, there were some Sufi practices that I wouldn't advise. Uh, but the ones we have been talking about uh, I think uh, sync nicely with uh, with that uh, literature. So uh, I'll leave it here. I will come back and uh, uh, discuss more next time. And uh, take care out there. All right.